Welcome to Frank's Diana Explains and to the Algorithms course at the University of Cambridge. In this section of the course, we're looking at data structures that, uh, broadly speaking, implement the dictionary abstract data type. You give them a key and they return a value. However, in the next few videos, we are going to look at ways of doing a little more than just that. Assuming that there is a total order defined on the keys, we may build more elaborate data structures that are capable of doing more interesting things as well. Besides returning the value associated with a given key, they can also locate the next highest or the next lowest key, and also the smallest of all keys or the greatest of all keys. The first such data structure is the binary search tree, which we study in this video. And by the way, if you find this material interesting, I'll be very happy if you leave a like on this video. Thank you. One more thing I should mention is that if we view search trees as an implementation of the dictionary abstract data type, then it only makes sense for the keys to be distinct. However, the various search trees we are going to be looking at are sufficiently versatile that they can cope with multi-sets of keys, so long as you replace some less than signs with uh, less than or equal signs in the appropriate places. Of course, if you do that, uh, then you are implementing something more general than a dictionary and with a slightly different contract for the task of giving you the value associated with a key. But the data structure will behave like a dictionary if you only give it distinct keys, plus it will also cope with uh, having multiple instances of the same key. What we are going to look at today is data structures to implement what we saw in abstract terms last time, uh, the table or dictionary abstract data type. We want to implement the table or dictionary. And in fact, we want to implement uh, the variant of dictionary that also uh, keeps track of keys that have an order on them, and therefore lets you find the predecessor and successor, and also the uh, largest and smallest. What's this red dot on your hand? Where's the laser from? Oh, wow. Okay. Right. I wish you had found the remote control for the projector instead of the laser, but anyway. All right. Um, This thing is, in gray, the skeleton of a binary tree. And I have filled up some of the vertices with integers, which are supposed to represent keys of items in the tree. The reason for storing anything in a data structure is, as we said, a dictionary of pairs of key and value. So I'm only showing the key. But the real reason for storing anything is the value. And uh, whatever happens to the key, the value travels with it. And although we are not showing the value, the whole point is to say, well, let me promptly retrieve this key so that I can get at the associated value. So imagine that each one of these has some value associated with it. If the value is too large, to be comfortably moved around, then you can just imagine that there is a value somewhere, and there is a pointer from the key to the value. So the key is a record that has the key itself and the pointer to the value. The value doesn't need to move. The key can move around, and the pointer um, to the value lets me retrieve the value when I finally need that. We will ignore the values in all the description of the data structure, because what matters is what happens to the keys. But always remember that this so-called satellite data is always associated with the key and is the main reason for uh, doing all the work you do on the keys. So this data structure we're uh, talking about now is called the binary search tree, uh, page 95 of your handout. And this binary search tree is a binary tree with the additional defining feature that if you take any node of the tree, then 
all the nodes in the subtree to its left have keys that are smaller than the node, and all the ones to the right have keys that are greater than the node. Uh, that holds for every node in the tree. And uh, in your handout on page 96, you have one such tree with keys that are letters of the alphabet uh, that have been obtained by inserting in the tree the characters that make up the word dinosaur. And they end up all jumbled up like this, but they, um, they are consistent with the property I described. For every node, all the keys to its left are smaller, all the keys to the right are larger. So, in what I said, I said uh, less than, strictly less than, because if we are dealing with a table or dictionary, as we described last time, then you cannot have duplicate keys, because otherwise, what would be the value associated with a given key? In some other contexts, when you're not implementing a table but something else, uh, it may make sense to do a variation on these data structures using uh, less than or equal sign, and then the things that are in this tree are less than or equal to this one, and the ones in here are less than or equal to this one, and so on. We will be speaking primarily of the, uh, the table implementation, and therefore we assume the absence of duplicates, which simplifies things somewhat. But things are not conceptually uh, very different if you also allow the equal case. If you compare this to another binary tree structure that we have seen, which is the uh, heap, the min heap or the max heap, you will notice that this one is not as neatly balanced as the heap. Uh, I have things here that um, are somewhat asymmetric, and I could uh, keep making them even more asymmetric. I could, um, I could insert another value, such as 11 here, for example. That is okay, because uh, 11 is smaller than 12, so it's on the left, but it's uh, also smaller than 23. It's uh, bigger than 10. It's bigger than 7. So that's the right place for 11. Well, actually, how do I find the right place for any node? Uh, if I want to insert any other uh, thing, for example, uh, uh, what's the number that's missing? Four, five, six, seven, eight, 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 Fifteen. <coughs> what would I have to do in order to insert fifteen? Maybe the easiest, we start by saying, what would I have to do to retrieve the key? What if I wanted to find what's the value associated with fifteen? I don't even know if 15 is in the tree at this stage. So I start uh, at the root and I say 15. Uh, is this smaller or bigger or equal uh, compared to this root key 7? Well, it's bigger. Therefore, if it exists, it must be in the right subtree. What about 10? Well, 15 is bigger than 10. So if it exists in the tree, it must be over here. What about 23? Well, 23, uh, 15 is smaller than 23. So if it exists, it must be on the left. What about 12? Well, uh, 15 is bigger, so if it exists, it must be on the right of 12, so it would have to be here, but this is a null pointer, there's nothing as the right child of 12, so if it existed, it would be here, if there's nothing here, it means it doesn't exist, and so um, I return the result that the key 15 is not in the table. And if I wanted to insert 15, I would do exactly the same procedure to try to insert 15, and if I got to a place where it should have been and it wasn't, then I say, well, that's where I can insert 15. So then I take my 15 and I insert it here. And what if I had wanted to insert 15 and I had done all this procedure and I say, well, it should be here, should be here, should be here, should be here, should be here. Ah, but it is here. And I wanted to insert this 15, but there is a 15. Then the table already has the key 15. So if I'm writing 15 in the table, it's probably because I have a key value that I want to insert in the table. And that means I want to overwrite the previous value associated with 15, 
with a new value associated with 15. So once I found where it is, I just change the satellite data that was here to the one that is attached to this one. So I overwrite the old satellite data with the new satellite data. Basically, I overwrite this thing in place if it's there, and if it's not there, I insert it there. This is the procedure for searching and the procedure for uh, inserting. If I consider my binary search tree as uh, a type, then a class, this will have some methods, one of which will be search, one of which will be insert, The remote control will be fine after I finish my lecture course. Um, search takes a key and returns a node. So a key um, is a, uh, a value, and a node is um, an object, a blob. So 15 is the value 15. And the node is the thing with the uh, circle around it and possibly the field that points to the satellite data. So when I say search, I say search 15, the value of the key. But I return, if I find it, a node here that actually also has this extra pointer and stuff. This distinction between keys and nodes that hold the keys and the satellite data is important. When I insert, I cannot insert just a key. I have to insert a node, obviously, because then otherwise, where would the value be if not uh, held in the node or pointed to by the node? Uh, I insert the node, and I return nothing. Uh, there would be a facility for deleting nodes, of course. Uh, I, uh, one might think, I want to delete something based on its key. Well, you, you would combine that by first searching for the key. Uh, and then once you found you found the key because it's in the table, then it returns your node, and then you can delete that node. And if you didn't find it, then you would say it's not there, then you wouldn't do the delete. The reason why it's important to split it into two and actually delete the node is because if you do allow the duplicates, then uh, if you say delete key 15 and there's two keys 15, then um, you need to specify which one it is. So if you say the node, then it's clear uh, which item you want. Also. Uh, if you're going to cost the operations, then uh, these things are costed on the basis of knowing which item to delete, whereas otherwise you're spuriously adding the cost of finding it first. Um, the other operations that derive from the fact that we are working in a context where the keys have an order defined on them, uh, are the predecessor and successor of a node. So notice here, I'm not giving a key, I'm giving a node. So I already know uh, where this is. And I'm saying, where is the predecessor of this node? Well, it would be here. Where is the successor of this node? It would be here. Where is the predecessor of this node? It would be here. Where is the successor of this node? There isn't one, because that's the biggest one. What is the... Um, systematic way of finding uh, the predecessor and the successor. Maybe an easier thing is first to look, what's the systematic way of finding the minimum uh, key in the tree? Well, the minimum key in the tree, if this is the root, these are things smaller than it, and these are things bigger than it, it, it must be something smaller than it, so it's, it's going to be in the left side. And for every node that I encounter, the minimum will be in its left subtree until I get to something that doesn't have a left subtree, and then there's nothing that's smaller than this one, and this was smaller than all the other ones, and that's where I find the minimum. So the minimum is simply obtained by traveling all the left pointers until I run out, and that's the minimum, and uh, symmetrically, that is the maximum of my tree. That's fairly easy. How about uh, looking for the predecessor and the successor? That is uh, slightly more involved, and so we'll, uh, we'll talk about it in a moment. Uh, but uh, before doing that, I want to talk about the costs of these various operations that we've done so far. So the search, insert, uh, minimum, and maximum. 
all of these operations are bounded by the height of the tree. Search, the worst that can happen is you get to the bottom, but you never, never do, you never follow more than one branch. So, so as, at worst, it's the path from a, a root, from the root to a leaf. Uh, similarly, for inserting, I may have to travel all the way to uh, a leaf if I'm not overriding a previous value. Uh, for finding the minimum, I travel all the way to the leaf that's leftmost or the leaf that's rightmost for the maximum. So all these operations are bounded by the height of the tree. However, unlike the heap, as we have already observed, this tree is not guaranteed to be balanced. The heap had a constraint on its shape that it was going to be uh, always almost full. So all levels complete except maybe the last one. And here, this level is not complete, and yet I have stuff on this other level. If you look at the example on page 96 with the dinosaur, that tree is extremely unbalanced. Um, it has one, two, three, four, five, six, a depth of six, uh, and it only has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight nodes, so uh, very unbalanced. In this case, the cost being the height could end up being uh, almost linear. You can imagine a tree of this that has a height linear in the number of nodes if you just keep appending nodes to the same side or to the same, to the same path. It doesn't have to go to the same side. It can zigzag, but if instead of branching out, you attach the same path, then the height of the tree will be linear. So although the fact that you're using a tree means the cost of these things is the height of the tree, here the height of the tree is not guaranteed to be logarithmic in the number of items you put in. And so after we deal with binary search trees, the rest, the, the next few lectures are going to be concerned with ways of keeping this type of trees balanced so that the cost of these operations being big O of the height is going to be big O of the log of the number of items. Otherwise, big O of the height could end up being as bad as big O of n as opposed to log n, which we would definitely not like and we would not be bothering with using this data structure. So um, before we get on with the job of looking for the predecessor and successor, I want to revisit something that you told me when I asked you last time uh, you had already seen, which is printing out the keys of a tree uh, in order or pre-order or post-order. So let's do in order for uh, simplicity. In this case, if I print the keys of my tree in order, because all the keys in my left subtree are smaller than the root and all the keys to the right are uh, greater than the root, printing the keys of the whole tree in order will sequence out all the keys in ascending order of key. So it's uh, very nice. I have, uh, if I visit a tree, then if the tree is empty, that's it. If the tree is not empty, first I print all the keys of its left subtree, then I print the root, the key of the root, then I print all the keys of the right subtree, uh, recursing twice. So I might do that in this case. I go into this one, and then I first have to go into this one, and I first have to go into this one to uh, print all the keys of the left subtree. Finally, uh, I get to a stage where there is no left subtree, so I can finally print the root, and that's three, and I print three. And then I print all the keys of its uh, right subtree, which doesn't have any, and therefore I return for my thing. So I pop from the stack, and what was I doing? I was printing all the keys in the left subtree of this guy. So finally I can print the root of this guy, and I print the four, uh, and so on. Uh, I can then print all the items in the right subtree of this one, and then I have to recurse and first do blah, blah, blah. And you can see how this procedure will print all the keys in order. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 15, 23. Okay. 
Ah, I have committed the usual sin of not pausing in between the numbers, so I will not be able to move them around. Let's hope it is not necessary. Otherwise, I'll have to rewrite all this junk. So, um, I think it's fairly easy for any of you who's still awake uh, to prove that if I am given a BST, the in-order print uh, will print the keys in ascending order. The thing that is maybe slightly less obvious is if I am given um, a sequence of keys that was obtained by printing the keys of a BST in order. Right? Are you still with me? I, I got this, and I'm told it was obtained by printing in order the keys of a BST. Can I deduce from that, well, the keys of a binary tree? Can I deduce from that that the binary tree is a BST? The implication in the opposite direction is trivial. The implication in this direction is not so trivial. And if I were to ask, yes. Ah, oh, thank you. Yes, I might need to zoom out. That's the usual catch with this thing. I think that the person who stole the remote control should be pilloried. People should be nailing them. <laughs> right. OK. Um, so what you see at the bottom is not that surprising. It's just the keys that you had in here uh, in order. And if I'm telling you, I obtain these things by running the in order visit and print recursive procedure on a binary tree which had some keys, obviously all these keys, can you deduce from that 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 binary tree obeyed the rule of the BST that every node had in its left subtree only smaller things and in its right subtree only bigger things? If I were to ask you this as an exam question, I might give you, I don't know, between two and four marks for it. So think about it. The questions for this year have not been submitted yet, so who knows. Um, no promises, of course. It's not that hard. We have to have some kind of insight. So um, does anybody have a clue? Still too early in the morning. Well, guys, it's only 10.26, so it's not that, uh, that early anymore. Should I be giving you more hints, or should I move on to the success? Well, let me move on to the success if we have time. At the end, I'll give you more hints. Anyway, uh, if I want to find the successor of a node, the successor of this node, uh, well, in this case, the successor is 6. That's easy. But why? The successor of a node, if the node has a right subtree, is going to be uh, in that right subtree, because the right subtree is made of only things that are bigger than this node. And things over here would be smaller, so they don't count. Uh, and things that are uh, over here, what would they be? Mm. It's easy to reason about stuff that's below me. It's not so easy to reason about stuff that's uh, above me. But uh, if, I, if I look at things below me, um, if I have a whole subtree instead of just this value, where would the successor of this one be? Of all the things that are bigger than this, it has to be the smallest. Otherwise, it's not just the next one after this 5. So it would have to be the minimum of this right subtree. So I, I go into my left, uh, into my right child, and I go left, 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 until there's no more left. In this case, there's no more left just here, so that's, that's the minimum of this subtree because it's the only value in this subtree. But if I looked at the successor of this one, then it's definitely gonna be in this subtree. It's gonna be the minimum of this subtree, and the minimum of this subtree is obtained by taking left, 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 and this, there's no more left. And so in this case, it's 8. If I wanted the successor of this one, then I go into this subtree, and I go left, 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 and the minimum of this subtree is 11. So 11 is a successor of 10. OK. But sometimes, someone 
doesn't have a rights of tree. Does it mean they have no successor? No. Uh, if they have no rights of tree, they may have a successor somewhere else. In fact, this guy seems to have a successor there. It has a successor there. Uh, and how do I get to the successor if I don't have a rights of tree? Well, in this case, what I do is I go back up the tree. And here I go up the tree left, up the tree left, up the tree right. So I go up the tree until my up goes right. I ignore all the up lefts, and the first up right points me to the successor. That seems a bit uh, like a magic trick. Why does it work? It works because if I flip the perspective and I look at it in reverse, this seven has a predecessor, and its predecessor must be in its left subtree, which is the things that are smaller than it, and it must be the maximum of the tree of smaller things. And so the maximum of this is where you go down right, 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 until there's no more rights, and so it takes us to this one, which obviously doesn't have another uh, right child, otherwise it wouldn't be the maximum of this subtree. So when you find something that doesn't have a right subtree, the dual viewpoint is that its successor will definitely have a left subtree, and inside it, you will find that as the maximum. And therefore, uh, if you reverse what you did, in order to find the successor of six, you have to go back to an ancestor that has six as the maximum of its left subtree. This is why you go up, 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 until you go right the first time. And when you go right the first time, it's because you were looking to the left subtree. And that's how you find your uh, successor when your node does not have a right subtree. And if you want to do a predecessor, then you flip the lefts and rights in what I have said. Um, so that's exercise 35. Why in BSTs does this up and right business find the successor? Can you sketch a proof? And I have just done that for you. Uh, and exercise 36, also reasoning about things, properties of the BST that are trivial once you get it, but are uh, obscure when someone else reads them out to you. Prove that in a binary search tree, if node n has two children, then its successor has no left child. Why? If a node n, for example, um, 10, has two children, eight and 23, then its successor, what's the successor of 10? I go into the right subtree and I find the minimum, so that's 11, that's true, 10, uh, 11 sounds like a plausible successor. Its successor has no left child, no left child, that's true. Exercise 36 got it right, why is it true? Uh, because if I am, if node n has two children, then it will always have a right subtree. The only case it cannot have a right subtree is if the right child is missing. So it, this cannot happen if you have two children. If you do have a right subtree, then your successor, you don't have to look above, your successor is going to be the minimum value in your uh, right subtree. And so the minimum value of your rights of tree is the value that's obtained by going left, 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 until you can no longer do that. And for that reason, it is not allowed to have a left child. So this is why the successor of n has no left child, because it is the minimum of the rights of tree of n. This is obvious once you get it, but it's not obvious uh, from the start. But it's something that we're going to use as a property for uh, what we do next. And what we do next is what I promised earlier I would do, which was uh, deleting uh, items from uh, BST. It was one of the other things I had parked. Pre successor we've just done, predecessor is the same except flipping left and right. And delete is another thing that I had left for later. Uh, and we are going to do now that we have the successor in our pocket. Deleting a node from a BST 
is obviously something you must do while leaving the data structure as a valid BST. If you delete anything that is uh, a leaf, then you have no consequences, and that's fine. You can delete any leaf uh, and just uh, carry on. But if you delete anything that is an internal node, then first of all, the data structure is not a binary tree anymore. So you have to reform the binary tree in some way. If you delete an internal node that has only one child, such as five uh, or uh, eight, then all you do is you can bring up the lone child to the position of the parent. And even if there is lots of extra stuff hanging off it, um, so here, you might have uh, what's between five and six? Five and a half. Uh, could be here. Uh, what's between six and seven? Six and a half. Six point three. Doesn't have to go halfway through. Anyway, so even if you had a subtree like this hanging off this, so long as it's just one child of five, if I'm going to delete five, then uh, I meant uh, moving child up five out of the way. I can just bring up this subtree wholesale. And it doesn't matter if it has a thousand nodes underneath. I just move it up by one. The parent of six become what becomes what used to be the parent of five. And so deleting things that have only one child is easy. Deleting things that have two children is trickier because you can do this you can do this operation on one side, maybe, uh, if I wanted to delete four. Uh, I can try to make uh, the new parent of six what used to be the parent of four, which was seven. If I do that, that's great. But when I bring my children there, that oops, that place is already taken. So uh, I can't do it. So I have to have some more complicated strategy for deleting a node that has two children, like four. If I want to delete a node that has two children and preserve the BST properties, so I'm here, whoop. I'm here, and at this stage, I should make use of the fact that, ah, so I did need what I, I needed this. I needed these things to be movable, and somehow I'm trying to move the three, and I'm ending up moving this 5.5. I have no idea why. I don't like you. Ah, that's because I had this thing, which I probably did with my wrist. So let me uh, rewrite 5.5 in a more economical way, 5.5. Okay, can I now move these things? Okay, this one I can move, this one I can move. And these ones all go together. <laughs> ha! Life of users of explain everything. So, five, three, four, five, we deleted five. So we have 5.5. We have six. We have 6.3. We have seven, uh, and that we can we can carry on with the other things that I drew before. I'm just gonna see if I can delete these other things. Okay, and there. delete this junk, and this is if you bear with me. That's um, in order print of the keys that I currently have in the tree. So my objective was to delete this uh, four. This one gets the chop, but I need to uh, somehow leave the thing in the shape of a uh, binary tree and a BST at that. So what do I do? If I look at this poor four in this output, then four is adjacent to its successor, obviously. 
5.5. So 4 is next to 5.5. I'm going to do something sneaky. I'm going to exchange 4 and 5.5. Ah, shock horror. It's not sorted anymore. Wait, wait, wait. It's OK, because I'm going to kill 4. <laughs> so if I kill 4, then what remains is in order, right? So I swap 4, which is on death row, with something else that will still survive it. And then when 4 is dead, I mean, now at this stage, things are a bit unhappy because of this inversion. But as soon as this one dies, then the world forgets about 4. And everybody goes on in their cynical way with a uh, sorted uh, sequence of things. And because of the things that I hinted at, I would give you maybe four marks uh, in the exam if you solve it by yourself, you can prove that if the output of the in-order print is sorted, then what it came from is a BST. Well, provided at least it's the shape of a binary tree. So if I manage to um, do that here, then this thing uh, will have worked. So I am here in a situation where I can see 4 and I can see its successor. Why don't I just swap them here? Swap 4 with the successor. Now, this is not a BST at this stage. It's uh, something that um, has a violation, this one, of the order. Uh, and it's not true that all the things in the right subtree of 5 are bigger than 5.5 uh, are bigger than 5.5. But as soon as I delete my 4, which is now in a position where it does not have children. Uh, actually, in the more general case, it might have children, but it would not have a left child. It would not have a left child because of the property that I said was important in exercise 36, because it is um, uh, the successor of a node that used to be here for that had two children then it has no left child, because it is the minimum of this subtree. It is in the position of the minimum of this subtree. So it cannot have a left child. It could have other things in here, but I don't care, because I already said that I can delete things that have only one child without trouble. I just bring up the rest. So this, is a, this node is now in a position where I can delete it. And so I delete it. Uh, I delete it, and in this case, there's nothing else. If there were anything else, I would bring it up. But that's OK. I get rid of this 4. And I get rid of the 4. If I were to print this in order, I would get rid of the 4 here. And what is left is now um, an ordered list, because this was the only inversion. So if I delete one of these, nothing else is out of order. Uh, and therefore, by the theorem that uh, I still urge you to prove, then uh, what remains here is a valid BST. Excuse me. And so that's how you delete things from no, that's how you delete nodes that have no children or one child or even two children. You can do every, uh, every case. So performance, as we said, is proportional to the height of the tree. And the thing that we do next is to make sure that this height of the tree is proportional to, is bounded by log n instead of being bounded just by n.